My name is Paul Vallone, and you are listening to 106.7, Wilmington's Big Talker. I would like to welcome you to Guns, Politics, and Freedom, where each Sunday at 5 p.m., as part of the Sunday Night Political Power Block, we give you the ammunition to better defend your gun rights. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Check them out at HyattGuns.com. In case you aren't familiar with me, I direct Grassroots North Carolina, or GRNC, since 1994, our state's most effective gun rights organization. As its director, I was involved in drafting and passing our original concealed handgun law. Since then, GRNC has gone on to engineer passage of concealed handgun reciprocity, our purchase permit bypass, Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground, the expansion of concealed carry to state and municipal parks, restaurants, public assemblies, educational properties, and much more. Grassroots North Carolina is exactly what the name implies, a grassroots collection of volunteers from all walks of life who share a common concern that our constitutionally guaranteed freedoms are being eroded. Check us out at grnc.org. That's grnc.org. In today's show, we will discuss the real story behind the recent tragedy in Christchurch, New Zealand, and what it means to you as an American gun owner. As always, what the ostensibly mainstream media is claiming is not exactly the truth. We will also discuss how the Second Amendment sanctuary movement has come to North Carolina, and we will talk about S7, the Senate gun confiscation bill now moving through the Senate and scheduled for a hearing on March 26th. First in gun rights news, the lawsuit against the pending bump stock ban filed by Gun Owners of America got its first day in court last week. As you may recall, in December, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives announced a new regulation which reclassifies so-called bump stocks as machine guns and therefore requires all such devices to be destroyed or turned in by March 26, 2019. In late December, GOA filed suit against the ban, choosing the relatively favorable Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals and filing suit in western Michigan. The BATFE has argued for Chevron deference, deference rather, meaning that the government should have broad latitude in reinterpreting existing regulations. Now, during arguments, uh, reports Gun Owners of America, the judge expressed wariness of the government's Chevron deference argument as GOA argued with apparent success that bump stocks do not meet the definition of machine guns. GOA has so far been successful in winning expedited consideration due to the impending March 26th deadline. More on this as it develops. Now about the new wave of gun and speech control that may be coming soon to a state near you. First, it was New York, of course, as is so often the case. In legislation introduced in the city of New York uh, in the past I'm sorry, State of New York, in the past November, prospective handgun owners would be required to turn over the passwords to their major social media accounts for a search by the state. Yeah, but that's just New York, right? After all, like California, New York is a lost cause and likely the worst state for gun rights in the country, which, by the way, is why I refer to myself as a refugee from New York. <clears throat> ah, but not so fast. Cut to Illinois last month. House Bill 888, should that have been 666? I'm not sure. Sponsored by Representative Daniel Didick, would require firearms, firearm owners' identification card applicants to provide a list of their social media accounts to the Department of State Police, DPS, in order that DPS can conduct a search of those accounts. A trend? Nah, that's Illinois, home, home of the Chicago gun ban, right? Well, I'm afraid now it's sped, spread to Florida, 
where three years ago, Democrat Florida State Senator Jason Pizzo proclaimed, quote, if you post it on social media, that's probable cause for us to come get the guns out of your house. Well, it seems that now the Florida senator is making good on his threat. Under his latest proposal, a social media postings which feature a even the picture of a BB gun by a minor could get your house raided. You can forget all that nonsense about stopping violent sociopaths. Plenty of mechanisms for that already exist. The bottom line is that the left now wants to control your speech. You see, as a gun owner, you are entirely too independent of mind. So to bring you to heel, they intend to make you watch each and everything you say. Hell, even the ACLU has reservations about these social media proposals. Not, of course, because that leftist interpreter of civil rights actually acknowledges the Second Amendment, of course, but accurately enough because the proposal stifles free speech. More on this trend as it develops. Elsewhere, our own Duke University School of Law just announced that they will tell us the meaning of the Second Amendment. How nice of them. Yes, indeed, the new Duke Center for Firearms Law will search, in their own words, for a scholarly alternative to the politically charged national debate surrounding gun rights and regulation. Duke Law University's jo Joseph Bloker and Daryl Miller will co-direct the new center, which will seek a, quote, middle ground in the gun debate. Bloker cites a, quote, lack of reliable scholarship on the Second Amendment and the constitutional question questions it raises. Says Bloker, people too often think that it's a question of either rights or regulation, that if you support gun rights, then you can't support any regulation and vice versa. And that's just a false choice. Well, I'm glad to know that. In fairness, I saw Bloker last year when he moderated a Campbell University Law School Second Amendment Symposium. He seems like a reasonable guy. And by accounts of other scholars in the field who actually respect the Second Amendment, he is an honest scholar. On the downside, however, however reasonable Bloker may be, he always seems to argue for gun control, as, for example, when he served as co-counsel for the District of Columbia in defending its complete handgun ban in the case D.C. versus Heller. Then we have the matter of the center's funding, which it admits comes in part from the leftist Joyce Foundation and, worse still, from anti-gun zealot Michael Bloomberg's AstroTurf organization calling itself Every Town for Gun Safety. Hmm. In the near future, I will be sending Bloker an open letter asking him to refuse funding from these biased anti-gun organizations. If the center is truly objective and centrist, I'm sure he will comply. More on that as it becomes available. In Connecticut, judicial activism is alive and well. On Thursday, the Connecticut Supreme Court ruled 4-3 to three to reinstate Soto v. Bushmaster, a lawsuit against Remington, owner of Bushmaster Firearms, by the owner of a Sandy Hook victim. A lower court had previously dismissed the suit. As you may recall, in 2005, Congress passed the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act, which prevents gun manufacturers from being sued for acts committed with firearms which function exactly as intended. You may also recall that in the late 1990s and early 2000s, a number of cities using the model of tobacco lawsuits attempted to sue gun makers out of business using what they then called novel legal arguments. The 2005 PLCAA stopped all of that. Gun, gun control advocates, of course, are touting this uh, decision as a minor victory on a roadmap for victims of other mass shootings to circumvent the long-criticized federal law. 
One of the plaintiff's claims in this case is that Bushmaster deliberately marketed its guns to school shooters. Yeah, I could see that. No problem. In reality, however, the lawsuit is unlikely to survive appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right now, we are going to take a short break. You are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7 WilmingtonBigTalker.com. After our break, we will return with still more information better enabling you to defend your gun rights, including what the Christchurch killings mean for gun rights right here in the United States. See you shortly. Listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. Our show is sponsored by Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Check them out at HyattGuns.com. Later in this show, we will discuss the growing Second Amendment sanctuary movement, which has now come to North Carolina. And in our third segment, we will begin to talk about the implications of the massacre in Christ Church, New Zealand. But grab a pen and paper because at the end of this segment, we will give you some information you need to stop the U.S. Senate from passing a so-called red flag gun confiscation bill, namely Marco Rubio's S7, and we need you to call our own Senator Tom Tillis. First, continuing in gun rights news, last week, Kentucky became the 16th state to adopt some form of permitless or constitutional carry in which lawful citizens don't need permits to carry concealed firearms. Joining Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Idaho, Kansas, Maine, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, North Dakota, uh, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wyoming as Governor Matt Bevan signed Senate Bill 150 into law. Meanwhile, here in North Carolina, HB 61 for permitless carry continues to languish in the House Rules Committee thus far denied a committee hearing. You may recall that in the 2017-2018 session of the General Assembly, HB 746 suffered a similar fate as it passed in the House but died in the Senate for lack of a hearing. So contact your North Carolina House rep and tell them to move HB 61. Elsewhere, throw out your Levi jeans, lads and lassies, because Levi's has gone leftist. This from the National Rifle Association, and I quote, Levi Strauss and Company established its brand in the mid-19th century by selling durable clothing to working-class Americans. As Levi's signature jeans gained popularity among a wider set in the middle of the last century, the pants became to symbolize American freedom. At one point, the company even celebrated Americans' armed heritage in a circa 1950 advertising brochure, quote, Levi's Gallery of Western Guns and Gunfighters. It is with some irony, then, that Levi's has abandoned this rugged image to team up with a billionaire oligarch in an effort to empower the government to trample upon the fundamental rights of the American people. On September 4th, Levi CEO Chip Berg announced that the San Francisco, there's your problem, San Francisco-based clothing manufacturer, which also owns Dockers, would openly advocate for gun control. As part of the campaign, the company will donate more than $1 million to radical anti-gun groups, including Michael Bloomberg's front group, Every Town for Gun Safety, and Giffords, formerly Americans for... Uh, responsible solutions, and the legal community against gun violence. The company will also match employee donations to these groups and is encouraging its staff to devote their time to anti-gun activism. Further, Berg stated the company has joined the Everytown Business Leaders for Gun Safety, the business wing of Bloomberg's outfit, which is dedicated to leveraging member companies, quote, market footprint, employee networks, and public communication platforms to diminish Americans' Second Amendment rights. In a repulsive insult to the nation's 100 million gun owners, Berg likened Levi's campaign to restrict the rights of law-abiding Americans to previous company efforts aimed at combating pre-civil rights era racial bigotry. You bigot. Among gun owners, uh, Levi's intemperate foray into the world of gun control politics has met with the disgust it deserves. 
However, it shouldn't be met with surprise. Late in the 1990s, Levi's used its name and resources to attack gun rights. In 1999, the company gave $100,000 to gun control group PAX, followed by a $250,000 donation in 2000 and another 100000 in 2001. PAX was uh, founded in 1998 by Dan Gross, who went on to become president of the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. PAX would go on to change its name to the Center to Prevent Youth Violence and later merge with the Brady Campaign. PAX endorsed a variety of severe gun control measures that have been repeatedly rejected by the American public. The document called for licensing and registration of guns like automobiles. The petition also demanded the elimination of assault weapons and other weapons of war. As the 1994 Clinton assault weapon ban was in place at the uh, time of the petition, this imprecise demand appeared to call for prohibiting the sale of the remaining lawful semi-automatic firearms, confiscation of those grandfathered under the ban, or both. Given Levi's 164-year history, 65-year history, Berg's decision to use a quintessentially, formerly quintessentially American company to attack a quintessential American right is a particularly sad episode in the current surge of corporate virtue signaling. We can only assume that Levi's accountants have determined that resulting skinny jeans sales will be enough to offset the permanent damage to their once-cherished brand. Don't buy Levi's. March 26th, a day that will live in infamy, not only because it is the day of implementation of the so-called bump stock ban, but also because it will be marked the first day a Republican-controlled United States Senate has taken up gun control in decades. The bill in question is S-7 for Extreme Risk Protection Order and Violence Prevention Act of 2019, sponsored by Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, Republican of Florida. Among its many provisions, so-called ERPOs would mandate confiscation of firearms from anyone deemed to be dangerous by vindictive exes, for example, or alienated family members, or even in some cases, petulant co-workers. Under these confiscation laws, you don't get a day in court prior to your guns being confiscated. Instead, This is done in ex parte or emergency hearings in which you not only don't get a chance to participate, you probably won't even know the hearing is taking place. Like, for example, the 60-year-old Ferndale, Maryland man who discovered police at his door at 5.17 a.m. after a family member with a grudge had lodged a complaint. In the ensuing encounter, he wound up dead, shot by police. Well, according to Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham, who seems to be returning to his old ways, uh, Graham is giving the bill a hearing in the Judiciary Committee on March 26th. But it gets better. Beyond the fact that the Republican body is about to become Democrat light and try to get loved by the media for passing gun control, our own Senator Tom Tillis, who is on the Judiciary Committee, is making noises like he plans to vote for the bill. <clears throat> this is what the good senator had to stay, say to constituents who contacted him about the bill. And I quote, thank you for taking the time to contact me about S7 Extreme Risk Protection Order and Violence Prevention Act of 2019. I appreciate hearing from you. I bet he doesn't appreciate hearing from me. As you may know, on January 3rd, 2019, Senator Marco Rubio introduced S7, which was referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee. If enacted... This bill encourages states to enact laws that enable law enforcement or family members the option to obtain a court order to prevent the purchase or possession of a firearm by an individual who they fear is a danger to himself, herself, or others. The bill essentially incentivizes states to enact these laws, yeah, by cutting off all their money, in compliance with the minimum standards by providing them priority access to certain grant funding. In addition, S7 details the process in which someone can seek an extreme risk protection order on someone who may be a threat by allowing the court to determine if there is uh, enough clear and convincing evidence to issue an order on the individual. The individual would also have the ability to eventually have the order terminated if they are found to no longer be a threat to themselves or others. 
We can all agree that people who are severely mentally ill are a threat to themselves and others, and we must do everything we can to ensure public safety. Acts of gun violence have sparked a national debate about how to prevent future attacks. Not surprisingly, much of that debate has focused on laws related to gun purchases and the mental state of those individuals in possession of firearms. I believe we can strike the right balance between protecting law-abiding citizens' Second Amendment rights while also being mindful of an individual's right to due process, yada, yada, yada. Does that sound like a conservative to you? Does that sound like somebody who will stand for your rights? Because you see, Tillis is lying by omission. He fails to mention that your guns can be confiscated under this bill in ex parte hearings, meaning without your knowledge, much less your participation in the hearing. That is a complete absence of due process under the Fifth Amendment. And don't think for a moment that a judge will refuse to issue the order. Judges routinely rubber stamp such measures so automatically that Gun Owners of America notes that uh, one New Mexico woman obtained a restraining order against David Letterman for sending her coded messages through her television set. You need to immediately contact Senator Tom Tillis and tell him to oppose S-7. Oppose it not only by voting against it, but to oppose all procedural measures that help advance the bill. For example, a cloture vote on the Senate floor. When you call him, his staffer will claim he doesn't support the bill, but his words suggest otherwise, so tell them so. Call Senator Tom Tillis at 202-224-6342. 202-224-6342. We will have more on this later in the show, but check out our website, grnc.org, where you will find a red banner at the top of the page saying, Stop Senate Gun Confiscation. You are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. After a short break, we will return with still more critical information enabling you to better defend your gun rights. My name is Paul Vallone, and you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom today on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. Our show is sponsored by Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Check them out at HyattGuns.com. <clears throat> In our last segment, uh, we noted that we need you to contact Senator Tom Tillis and tell him not to support S-7 for the Red Flag Gun Confiscation Bill, which is up for a hearing on March 26th in the Judiciary Committee, of which Tillis is a member. And what's more, Tillis has expressed at least some support for the bill. Call Senator Tillis at 202-224-6342. Again, tell him to oppose Senate Bill 7. Again, the number is 202-224-6342. 202-224-6342. I also strongly urge you to go to grnc.org. That's grnc.org. At the top of the page, you will see a red banner which says, Stop Senate Gun Confiscation, and it will give you still more things you can do to defend your rights. As you may know, certain counties across the United States responding to recently passed gun control, either in their state or elsewhere, have adopted Second Amendment sanctuary resolutions, which essentially refuse to comply with gun control legislation passed either by their state or the federal government. Such measures have recently passed in counties in Colorado, Illinois, New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington, and are also being considered elsewhere. The initiatives started in earnest when a large number of state, uh, state of Washington sheriffs refused to enforce recently enacted gun control in that state. Ironically, this sanctuary movement derives its inspiration from another sanctuary movement, this one being promoted by the left as sanctuary cities which refuse to enforce American immigration law. I love it when the left's own tactics get turned on them. In fact, I have made an art out of it. Anyway, <clears throat> I am happy to report that the Second Amendment sanctuary movement has come to North Carolina. 
Recently, our own Cherokee County in western North Carolina passed just such a resolution. County Commissioner Dan Eichenbaum drafted the measure and spoke on its behalf with Sheriff Derek Palmer expressing support for the resolution. Palmer cited statistics, including uh, many statistics, including that someone uses a gun in self-defense in the United States every 13 seconds, saying those who have called for gun control have acted out of fear, emotions, and knee-jerk reactions. The measure passed by a 3-2 vote. Says the resolution passed by Cherokee County in part, on behalf of the citizens of Cherokee County, North Carolina, the Cherokee County Board of Commissioners state and accept as true the following. One, the Declaration of Independence states that people are, quote, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. <clears throat> Two, John Adams wrote in a uh, dissertation on the canon uh, and feudal law, 1765, quote, I say rights, for such they, the people, have undoubtedly antecedent to all earthly government, rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws, rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. Three, natural law rights given to each of us by our Creator are the basis of our Constitution by which they are protected and secured to each of us. Natural law rights, including that of self-protection, are guaranteed by our laws, our history, and our traditions. <clears throat> Four, it is the natural tendency of civil government to expand upon the limits of its rightful constitutional authority and to usurp powers which have not been given it through the delegated consent of the governed. 5. Whenever the uses of government are perverted, individual sovereignty is overtly endangered or threatened, and all other means of redress are ineffective, the people may, and in fact ought to, force the reestablishment of the original constitutional limits of government. 6. Resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is the obligation of every patriot, and not to do as is destructive to the good and happiness of mankind. In fact, it is the duty of the people of Cherokee County, through the actions of their lesser magistrates, namely local elected officials and sheriffs, to challenge the civil government when and where it exceeds or threatens to exceed its bounds. 7. The Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of our nation. 8. The Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States states, quote, A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. 9. The U.S. Supreme Court found in Miranda v. Arizona, 1966, stated, quote, where rights secured by the Constitutional are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. 10. The U.S. Supreme Court in the District of Columbia v. Heller, 2008, affirmed that the S Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms is not connected in any way to service in a militia. 11. The U.S. Supreme Court in United States v. Miller, 1939, stated that firearms are part of ordinary military equipment with use that could contribute to the common defense, are protected by the Second Amendment. 12. The Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, Section 1, states, No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any person deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. 13. The U.S. Supreme Court in McDonald v. City of Chicago, 2010, affirmed that a person's Second Amendment rights to keep and bear arms is further secured by the Due Process and the Privileges and Immunities Clauses of the 14th Amendment. The decision also protects rights closely related to the Second Amendment, namely the right to manufacture, transfer, purchase, and sell firearms, accessories, and ammunition. 14. The North Carolina Constitution, Article 1, Section 5, states, quote, Every citizen of the state owes paramount allegiance to the Constitution and government of the United States, and no law or ordinance of the state, in contravention or subversion thereof, can have any binding force. 
15. The North Carolina Constitution, Article 1, Section 30 states, and this is one you should all know, by the way, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And as standing army, armies in time of peace are dangerous to liberty, they shall not be maintained. And the military shall be kept under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Nothing herein shall justify the practice of carrying concealed weapons or prevent the General Assembly from enacting penal statutes against that practice. There is a significant movement afoot to remove that last sentence. We'll see how that, uh, that, that uh, works out. 16. The North Carolina Constitution, Article 1, Section 16 states, Retrospective laws punishing acts committed before the existence of such acts and by them only declared criminal are oppressive, unjust, and incompatible with liberty, and therefore no ex post facto law shall be enacted. No law taxing retrospectively sales, purchases, or other acts previously done shall be enacted. 17. The Tenth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States states, quote, The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. And 18. The U.S. Supreme Court found in Prins v. United States, 1997, that the federal government cannot compel law enforcement officers of the states to, in effect, to enforce federal laws uh, as it would increase the power of the federal government far beyond that which the Constitution intends. Therefore, the people of Cherokee County, North Carolina, through their duly elected officials on the Board of Commissioners, resolve that Cherokee County is hereby designated a gun sanctuary county in order to preserve for the people of, on, and in Cherokee County the unalienable right to keep and bear arms, as specified by the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, the Constitution of North Carolina, and further upheld by subsequent decisions of the United States Supreme Court, the right, as originally written and understood, to keep and bear arms for self-defense, personal safety, protection of one's family, and in defense of one's community and county, and the right to manufacture, transfer, purchase, and sell firearms and ammunition designated for those purposes outlined above. There is a little bit more to this, but essentially, uh, this is good stuff. I would bear in mind, however, that these resolutions are non-binding. Nevertheless, they demonstrate that a healthy proportion of our population is finally starting to get it. They're finally starting to say, of gun control, we will not comply. That is what will eventually hopefully cause the end of this sort of usurpation of power. Right now you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. We're going to take a short break, after which we will return with the implications of the New Zealand massacre for your freedoms. My name is Paul Vallone, and you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom today on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. Our show is sponsored by Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Check them out at HyattGuns.com. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know that on Thursday, a sociopath in Christchurch, New Zealand, entered two mosques and using a variety of weapons, killed a total of 50 people, wounding an additional 34, all while wearing a GoPro video camera and live-streaming the horrific act on Facebook. And before all of this, the killer left a so-called manifesto detailing his supposed reasons for the crimes, as though there could be any justification, a manifesto widely and misleadingly quoted by the ostensibly mainstream media. After the killings, the media wasted little time in promoting a false narrative aimed, of course, at curtailing your right to keep and bear arms. The killings were the work of conservative right-wing extremists, they said. The inspiration drew from Donald Trump, they said. And of course, the shooter's so-called manifesto condemns gun control, they said. 
Of course, as so often is the case in recent years, all of these media claims are lies. And of course, leftists like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wasted little time in blaming the NRA, saying, quote, what goods are your thought, good are your thoughts and prayers if we can't keep our pews safe? But fake news aside, what actually motivated the shooter and what does it mean on a broader scale? The world, of course, will spend years debating what it all means. But right now I can tell you what it doesn't mean. It wasn't the act of a conservative white supremacist. In truth, the shooter was a liberal, is a liberal, progressive, socialist-oriented environmentalist. According to his own manifesto, his philosophy aligns most closely with communist China. He says, Were, are you a fascist? He asked himself. Yes, for once the person that will be called a fascist is an actual fascist. I'm sure the journalist will love that. I mostly agree with Sir Oswald Mosley's views and consider myself an eco-fascist by nature. The nation with the closest political and social values to my own is the People's Republic of China. The next thing I can tell you for sure is that gun control failed. New Zealand has strict gun control, including a requirement that semi-automatic firearms be registered exactly as the American left claims will keep us safe. Moreover, all the, gun, the shooter's guns were purchased legally in accordance with that strict gun control, according to New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, I guess is Jacinda Ardern, who noted that he legally acquired five guns. That, of course, didn't prevent the Prime Minister from promising that New Zealand's gun laws, quote, would change. Invariably, the solution for failed gun control is more gun control. Gun writer David Codria described New Zealand's gun laws in Friday's AmmoLand.com by saying, quote, In New Zealand, private possession of fully automatic weapons is restricted to police-approved licensed gun owners with a collector license endorsement. Each automatic or restricted weapon must be registered to its owner and disabled when not in use. In New Zealand, private possession of handguns, pistols, and revolvers is restricted to police-approved licensed gun owners with a pistol license endorsement. Each handgun must be registered to its owner and securely stored. Special license endorsement firearms require a genuine reason for possession, quote, including sports hunting, uh, sports shooting, hunting, and collection. Owning a firearm for self-defense is specifically excluded and prohibited. New Zealand requires criminal and mental health checks with third-party character references. It has licensing and registration of all of individual civilians licensed to acquire, possess, sell, or transfer a firearm or ammunition. It has domestic violence prohibitions. Compare that to the universal background check and red flag uh, ERPO edicts demanded for the U.S. as common sense. Private sales require a license, and the buyer of a firearm in a private sale in New Zealand is ob obliged to pass official background checks before taking possession. Yet, David says... Still, it is not enough, which tracks with experience here. What left, what's left is a total ban, something, quote, common sense gun safety law proponents dismissed as NRA propaganda, but which the less restrained in the citizen disarmament movement have demanded on too many occasions to ignore. The next reality is that the shooter didn't really object to gun control. He was trying to foment gun control. Allow me to quote his own words. At, Won't your attack result in calls for the removal of gun rights from whites in the United States? He asked himself. Yes, that is the plan all along. You said you would fight to protect your rights in the Constitution. Well, soon will come the time. The next reality, the New Zealand police were useless. Noting that police were nowhere to be found during a rampage, the uh, police professional site policeone.com analyzes what it calls seven critical takeaways from the massacre, including number two, quote, the public must assume a role in their own defense, in which the analyst, a 30-year-old veteran, says, quote, I've written about what I call the third generation of active shooter response, and this tragedy underscores my points. 
regardless of where you are in the world, whether it be a synagogue in Pennsylvania, a church in Texas, or a mosque in New Zealand, the police will always be absent when the attacker arrives. Faith-based organizations, schools, workplaces, and public venues must take an active role in their own security and leave behind the fiction that police will be able to protect them from evil during the initial minutes of an attack. The public must embrace target hardening, security protocols, emergency response training, security teams, medical training, emergency communications, and armed defense preparations to ensure that they can discourage attacks, deny access, and defeat attackers prior to police response. In the live streamed attack on the uh, mosque, the attacker was on site for six minutes, killing innocents, and was able to escape and take his attack mobile several minutes before police responded. Time is a precious commodity in attacks like these, and the killing is often done before the police have arrived. It's no longer acceptable for the public to outsource their security to the police. They must take an active role in their own defense and defense preparations. The next takeaway for me, the next, th the next reality of this, I guess, is that the lone hero who shortened the rampage could have done a lot more if he were armed. Abdul Aziz reportedly called to the shooter, making himself a difficult target, dodging shots, and picked up a gun discarded by the shooter, which he tried unsuccessfully to fire. Can you imagine what he might have accomplished had he been armed? Folks, I watched the raw GoPro video, now largely excised from the Internet. Yes, I know that Many say to watch the video is to assist the perpetrator in delivering his message. But I watched it as I watch every violent or defensive gun use video that I can find because I know to, I want to know how the events really come down, what killers really do, how best to stop them. Now, to, to describe the video as grim would be a serious understatement. Time stretched on seemingly infinitely, during which the shooter faced absolutely no opposition to his horrific evil. Victims fled or more commonly huddled in corners, waiting to be slaughtered. When no more victims in a room remained, he went back to deliver final shots to those already struck. Still, no police arrived. No serious opposition faced him save for one unfortunate soul who tried an unarmed rush on the shooter and died for his effort. What I was left with was an overwhelming sense of how easily the entire thing could have been stopped. I imagined being inside the mosque and hearing shots outside. I imagined an armed individual inside the mosque simply flattening himself against the wall of the doorway through which the shooter entered gun raised in a braced ready position, waiting for the shooter. And then, as the shooter entered, I envisioned the defender simply emptying the magazine into the body of that violent sociopath at a distance of perhaps ten feet, and I imagined the dozens of lives that could have been saved. New Zealand might be known for its sheep, but the reality is that leftists want us all to be sheep, obedient, docile, and awaiting whatever fate, including slaughter, awaits us. I don't know about you. Every man or woman must make his or her own decision. But speaking for myself, no law passed by any government will ever make me submit to slaughter. Not me, not my family. My name is Paul Vallone. You've been listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, where each Sunday at 5 p.m. as part of the Sunday Night Political Power Block, we give you the ammunition to better defend your gun rights. Check out our sponsor, Hyatt Guns, HyattGuns.com. I encourage you to check out my website at GunsPoliticsAndFreedom.com, where you can find my writings and earlier editions of the show. See you next Sunday at 5. <laughs>